On behalf of the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council, welcome to today's ITRC online training, Remediation Management of Complex Sites. My name is Mary Yelkin. I'm coming to you from Lincoln, Nebraska. And today's training is an introduction to a guidance document that has been developed by ITRC, and that's Remediation Management of Complex Sites. And although the trainers are going to introduce you to some of the information and share a lot of the information with you, we can't go into all the details that are available in that document. So if you haven't already done so, we strongly encourage you to take a look at that guidance document, and we hope it will become a resource to you as you're working at complex sites. Today's training is sponsored by the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council, or the ITRC, and is hosted by the US EPA Cleanup Information Network, or CLUIN. A few housekeeping items as we get started. As I mentioned, today's training is being recorded, so we can provide that as an archive to other ITRC customers in the future. The trainers will be in control as they move through the slides today. If you want to have your own copy of the slides, you can access that through the Clue and Training page you were initially directed to. It's also available through that related links section over on the right-hand side of your screen. If you want to get to that uh, information on the Clue and Training page, you click on the Clue and Training page and then click Browse to. Throughout today's training, we want to hear from you, with both your questions and your feedback. So we'll have two times today, about midway through and again at the end, where you can ask your questions verbally, and our trainers will be responding to those questions. You can also, at any point during today's session, enter your written questions in the Q&A pod in the lower right-hand corner. That will come into our trainers, and we'll get to as many of those as possible during the question answer sessions. Also, our trainers will be responding as they are able to the written questions as well. We do want to get everybody's feedback today, so at the end of today's training, there is a feedback form for you to complete. If you're someone who needs a certificate of participation to help you document your continuing education credits, you can access the certificate of participation by filling out that feedback form, clicking the box to certify you participated today, and then a certificate will be generated for you. The Interstate, Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council is a state-led organization hosting by the Environmental Council of States, and we're a network of state regulators working alongside with federal partners, being Department of Energy, Department of Defense, and the Environmental Protection Agency, along with industry affiliates, program members, academia, and community stakeholders. All of these groups come together to develop tools and resources to help people make better decisions when they're working on environmental sites. The full ITRC disclaimer is available on the ITRC website. If you do plan to use ITRC materials, we ask that you review that ITRC usage policy and give credit to ITRC. ITRC is partially funded by the U.S. government. ITRC nor the U.S. government warranty material or endorse any specific products. Now, ITRC has a wide variety of guidance documents, training classes, both online classes and in-person classes. To find out more about that information or how you can get more involved with ITRC, please access the ITRC website as listed on this slide. All of our trainers have been members of ITRC's Remediation Management of Complex Sites team. If you'd like to learn more about them, you can read their bios as available in the link at the bottom of this slide. Our first trainer is John Price. He is with the Washington Department of Environmental excuse me, Department of Ecology. We will then hear from Roy Thun with GHD, Chuck Newell with GSI Environmental Incorporated, and Mike Truex with the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, as well as Sam Brock, retired from the U.S. Air Force Civil Engineer Center. We're very pleased to have these experts share their wisdom with us today on this very difficult topic. And we very much appreciate them volunteering to serve as ITRC trainers. So with that, we'll turn it over to John Price with the Washington Department of Ecology on slide number six. John? Thanks, Mary. So what is the challenge at complex sites? Why was this team formed? As a profession, we have almost 40 years of experience with environmental remediation. But at some sites, complete remediation is still a significant challenge. As a regulator like myself, a consultant or an owner, you might have taken care of the immediate risk to human health the environment, 
but it may be decades or even longer to reach regulatory standards at your site. At other sites, remediation progress may be uncertain. Although each site is unique, we sometimes wonder if anyone has solved a problem like the ones we're dealing with. As a team, we came up with the following description of a complex site, a site where remediation progress is uncertain and remediation is not expected to achieve closure or even long-term management within a reasonable time frame. Uh, can you pull up that poll, poll Mary? Um, this, the poll highlighted some uh, examples of challenges that we all face at complex sites. We'll talk some more about site challenges in today's training. And it looks like a, a large number of us uh, have worked at complex sites. There's a number of factors that will be described later as far as what makes a site complex. Oops. Okay, Here's, here are two examples of complex sites. Many more are presented in the case studies associated with the guidance document. The first photo is an aerial view of the Rocky Flats site in Colorado. This former U.S. Department of Energy facility is 10 square miles and was used for manufacturing parts for nuclear weapons. The $7 billion cleanup was completed in October 2005 and at the time was the largest environmental cleanup of a CERCLA site. Our case study features remediation efforts at just one of the four groundwater plumes that came from five solar evaporation ponds that were used to store low-level radioactive waste and other waste. The commingled uranium and nitrate plume covered 50 acres. The second photo shows investigation work in a crowded residential area affected by vapor intrusion and groundwater contamination downgradient of the Moffett Field, Middle Field, Ellis, Wisman, or I'll refer to it in a later slide as the MEW site in California. This site is complex because of multiple source areas, multiple responsible parties, uh, the need to address commingled plumes, eight different aquifer zones, geologic heterogeneities, exposure pathways, and residential land use. That's a challenging site. Um, nationwide, the National Research Council um, did a 2013 uh, evaluation that sparked interest in forming our RTRC team. At the time, they estimated that approximately 10% of sites are complex with a total cost to complete estimate of $127 billion. Since that time, the U.S. Government Accountability Office has come out with an, um, es uh, an um, estimate of multi hundreds of billion dollars and has characterized environmental cleanup liability as the U.S. third largest liability after Social Security and Medicare. Oh. Okay. This ITRC guidance is for state regulators like myself, site owners, their representatives, and other stakeholders working at complex sites. Our team was large and diverse. We had almost 200 team members, which was the largest team in ITRC history. We had representatives from different groups. This guidance represents a recommended process for mediation at complex sites termed adaptive site management. This guidance incorporates and refers to best management practices existing tools and technologies that are described in previous publications by the US EPA, ITRC, the Department of Defense, and others. We've included 16 case studies where regulatory decisions have been made, but for many of these case studies, it will take decades to establish whether site objectives will be met. I found the case studies to be really encouraging when I saw the challenges that others had dealt with and overcome. I regulate an incredibly complex and highly contaminated site but some of the case studies in this guidance, frankly, still stunned me. Uh, stakeholder perspectives at Complex are also um, summarized in the case studies. One thing you can do at your own Complex site is ask different parties, what is their definition of success for the site? You'll likely hear different answers from the site owner, the consultant, uh, regulators, and community interest groups. Okay. This figure is small here on screen, but there is a full page version of the flowchart under additional resources, and the figure was also provided along with your registration information. This slide provides a roadmap to today's training, which follows the organization of the guidance. Following the introduction, we will talk about site challenges, uh, which is content from Chapter 2 of the guidance, talk about a remediation potential assessment tool, Chapter 3, talk about adaptive remedy selection, Chapter 4, and long-term management, Chapter 5. 
We will highlight case studies and stakeholder engagement throughout the training. Um, those appear in Chapter 6 and 7 of the guidance. This flowchart shows the adaptive site management process and the color coding corresponds with each chapter where the steps are discussed in detail. Adaptive site management is a comprehensive, flexible, and iterative process that is well suited for complex sites where there is significant uncertainty in remedy performance predictions. Adaptive site management involves periodically evaluating and adjusting the remedial approach against interim objectives. It may involve multiple technologies at any one time, and the technologies being applied may change over time. So why do adaptive site management? First of all, um, it does not offer shortcuts or the means to avoid site remediation. We will continue to maintain protection of human health and the environment and fulfill regulatory requirements while managing the site. Adaptive site management can improve site decisions and streamline decision making, decreasing remediation costs and potentially reducing remediation timeframes. It can help establish milestones to dem demonstrate interim progress that eventually leads to the long-term goal. It can reduce potential technical, regulatory, and procedural barriers to using various remediation management approaches that exist but are infrequently practiced. And it can encourage returning all or part of the site to beneficial reuse earlier in the remediation life cycle as remediation objectives are reached while recognizing that additional time is needed to achieve the overall site objectives. Um, one of our case studies is the U.S. Navy uh, Operable Unit 3 at the Jacksonville Naval Air Station. After a year 2000 remedial decision, the Navy did two five-year reviews of the cleanup decision and also did some remedy optimization studies. They then selected adaptive site management using specifically that name. They then discontinued the selected interim remedies, did some additional site characterization, and updated the site conceptual model. The site then moved to a risk-based remediation approach supported by technology demonstrations. Okay, one of the keys to your success is engaging stakeholders. Um, adaptive site management includes stakeholder involvement throughout the process. Stakeholders include all groups and individuals potentially impacted by the project. At complex sites, there may be multiple stakeholder groups, and there's likely a long site history to take into account. Chapter 7, as I mentioned earlier, provides stakeholder perspectives and concerns at complex sites. It also includes best practices to help stakeholders engage with owners and regulators. The recommendation is involve stakeholders early, build trust, foster respect, and improve the quality of decision. Case studies of complex indicate that effective stakeholder engagement reduces the cost of remediation and long-term management. How do we know that? Because there is a cost to delaying decisions. At some of our sites, the surveillance and maintenance costs are huge, and work done in the future always has a higher cost than the same work done now. So getting to a decision earlier is beneficial. Okay, um, we saw a picture earlier of the MEW site. One of the unique aspects of ITRC is that we involve community stakeholders on the teams that develop guidance. Our team had multiple stakeholder representatives for, um, because of the high degree of interest at complex sites. Stakeholders contributed to several of our case studies, which is reflected in those case studies' descriptions of community involvement. The MEW case study was nominated by stakeholders. Um, those stakeholders influenced changes to characterization and the selected remedy. They essentially became part of the remedy because they recommended local zoning and permitting requirements that address vapor intrusion problems at this site. This case study is an example of how remediation process and outcomes can improve because of stakeholder involvement. Okay, after today's training, you should be able to identify and integrate technical and non-technical site challenges into a holistic approach to remediation. You should be able to use the remediation potential assessment tool that you'll learn about to identify whether adaptive site management is warranted at your site due to site complexity. You'll understand and apply adaptive site management principles. You'll be able to develop a long-term performance-based action plan and apply well-demonstrated techniques for effective stakeholder engagement. Um, we're going to give you um, access to additional resources, tools, and case studies that are most relevant for complex sites, and we'll expect you to communicate the value of this guidance to regulators, practitioners, community members, and others. 
Uh, that concludes the introduction to the training. In the remaining sections of the training, we will be discussing site challenges, remediation potential assessment, we'll break for questions and answers, we'll, we'll look at adaptive remedy selection, long-term management, and then we'll prepare you to take action, followed by an additional question and answer uh, period. With that, I will turn it over to Roy Thun with GHD Environmental. Roy, are you with us? Mary? Yes, I Mary, can hear you now. There you go. Okay, sorry, I thought it was going to automatic unmute. All right, sorry about that, folks. Uh, in this next section, we'll be talking about Chapter 2, the site challenges. And these are the, the challenges which cumulatively really do make a site complex. Uh, as you see it highlighted on your slide in front of you, uh, it's to identify and integrate technical and non-technical site challenges into that holistic approach that John had mentioned uh, to remediation. And part of this is to really help improve uh, your awareness of those challenges because they can influence the path of a site. And that's really the whole point. When you look at that flow chart, it's understanding the influences to the site and, and, and to better make decisions with that full awareness that hopefully will get you to an end state, uh, whether it's closure or some beneficial reuse uh, that can be achieved in a reasonable time frame. Later on in the, in the uh, today's presentation, you'll learn about how to quantify these challenges and create a holistic adaptive site management plan. So next, we'll go to what a complex site is. Now, what you're looking at here is the uh, Tri-State Mining District site. Now, this is a site that covers 2,500 square miles, it has widespread contamination in soil and groundwater and surface water. So the question to you all is, you know, would you consider this a complex site? And you probably would, as most people we've talked to have. But what you'll see here in my discussion and in further discussions today is that the size of a site is really just one factor that contributes to its complexity. John had, had briefly gone over the description of a complex site. So I won't repeat it here for you, but I, I do want to mention that some background. When the team was formed, we spent weeks debating this definition. Uh, we all understood that remediation is inherently difficult, even at simple sites. So really, uh, what made the challenge for us is understanding the intricacies of these technical and non-technical challenges and that aspect of a reasonable time frame. Ultimately, what we really want people to understand is that the term complex sites is just a term. Uh, it's more important to be able to understand and, and identify those, those challenges to be able to improve your conceptual site model and maximize remedial effectiveness. And that's what we'll be talking about in my presentation and those that follow. Oops, Mary, I think we have a poll question. I'll, uh, if you can bring that up, and then I'll go to the next slide. So on your screen, you should have a poll question. And it asks, which remediation time frame usually makes for a complex site? And you can see your options, greater than 10 years, greater than 30, greater than 60, greater than 100. And if you scroll down, there's actually one more, which uh, two more. Time frame does not determine site complexity. Of course, we won't consider no vote. So hopefully, everybody will vote on this. We'll give you a chance to fill that out. OK. And it looks like it's coming through that the majority of folks are looking at time frame does not determine site complexity. So let's look at that, your responses in the context of, of what we asked of the state regulators. We did a similar survey of them, and we'll show you what their responses were. Mary, you can pull down the poll question. So here what you're seeing is similar to your responses. The major there was no consensus, but the majority of respondents from the state agencies was similar to yours. Remedial time frame does not determine site complexity. Uh, now, what this really tells us is that remedial time frame is relationship to complexity is, is basically in the eye of the beholder. 
And the reason I say that is uh, most state and federal agencies, they just don't define reasonable time frame. And because of that, there's some ambiguity to understand that relationship between a site's complexity and, and the time to, to reach your site objectives. And what we want to make sure is that when you think about time frame, that you're thinking about those site objectives and that you take, you take consideration of both those technical and non-technical challenges. So let's look at those challenges that can increase a uh, remediation time frame. In the guidance, we break it down into two categories, those technical and non-technical. And this is by no means a uh, covers the, the universe of technical and non-technical examples. But we felt this is a, a good um, cross-section of the types of challenges that come up at many sites that lead to um, designation of being complex and, and can affect the ability to achieve uh, site objectives in a reasonable time frame, if not well understood. We'll start out by looking at the technical side of the house. And here we have geologic conditions. What you're seeing here under geologic conditions are things like heterogeneity and preferential flow paths, fractured bedrock or karst bedrock, low permeability media. All of those can contribute to the complexity of a site. The in, inset photo is a uh, clay unit, which is dipping from your upper left to your lower right. And it's an example of a stratigraphic heterogeneity. Now imagine if you were installing wells into the subsurface, not knowing what this geologic, geology looked like. When you, when you got your uh, water data or your levels, you might think one certain thing based on the results. But in reality, what would happen in this particular case is your wells could very potentially be installed in completely different and non-connected um, stratigraphic zones. So these are the types of complexities that just uh, can confound a conceptual site model, uh, which makes, of course, the understanding of geology so critical to a site. Next, we look at hydrogeologic conditions, you know, extreme or variable groundwater velocities. Things like fluctuating water table, deep contamination, and other items like surface water and groundwater interactions that impacted sites. Um, and here we have an example of the Savannah River site in South Carolina. And what you see in that kind of tannish orange um, area, that groundwater plume, it's interacting with that four mile branch uh, river uh, water body, and that in itself causes tremendous complexities to the site, understanding the dynamics of fate and transport and interaction between sediments and surface water. Next, we look at geochemical conditions. Now, geochemical conditions are somewhat in, uh, unique in that many of sites that have uh, strong geochemical conditions uh, that are confounding us, uh, the CSM are often found in more remote areas. And these are things like geochemistry, right? Alkalinity, uh, pH, could be um, hardness even. Other areas could be uh, extreme groundwater temperatures where you have uh, geothermal sources or low temperatures like permafrost. In the inset photo, you're looking at the North Pole refinery. Now, I was born and raised in Southern California, so for me, the, the last thing I would want to do is get out of my car each day uh, in an area where the sun perhaps never sets or is always uh, below the horizon and and come to this particular uh, uh, scenery. It's just not necessarily fitting for my, um, my thin blood. Next we'll look at some contaminated related conditions. The NAPLs or non-aqueous phase liquids, which are divided into lighter than non light non-aqueous phase liquids, or L-NAPLs, and the dense non-aqueous phase liquids, or D-NAPLs. You also have recalcitrant contaminants like metals, high concentrations of multiple contaminants, and emerging contaminants like PFAS, or per- and polyfluoroalkali substances. The two uh, items shown here on your slide are the integrated d site strategy document, uh, guidance document created by ITRC in 2011 and still widely used today as a reference document. The more recent uh, PFAS 
fact sheets which have come out from ITRC are a fabulous resource for understanding uh, the background on food PFAS, how it was used and where it was used, um, the issues that are associated with it uh, in terms of its chemical properties, and even some alternatives for P, uh, PFAS use. And of course, we can't forget the scale of a site, right? the location and extent of contamination, depth of contamination, and number and type of proximity of receptors, and the extensiveness of uh, commingled plumes. Again, the familiar uh, tri-state mining district site, uh, which I'd already talked about, but adding a little bit more information on it. As you can see, the site straddles three states, but also two EPA regions. So imagine coordinating agency input for decision making here. Simple things at many other sites, like uh, underground utility, uh, become substantially more complicated trying to deal with when you have a site of this magnitude. But it's not just large-scale sites that can cause uh, complex situations. Here we have the UGI Columbia gas plant site in Pennsylvania. Now this site is only at one and a half acres in size. It sits about 400 feet from the Susquehanna River, and it had 100 years of gas manufacturing, yet overflows from a tar separator that entered into the subsurface and the river. And of course, when that happened, eventually got down deep into fractured bedrock. Now, we understand the properties of the tar that would dissolve over centuries. And that's the point, is that even at a small site, you can have very difficult technical challenges. So this is just giving you a, a glimpse of the type of technical challenges that you might face at a site. So now let's, let's turn to the non-technical challenges. Now, in the non-technical challenge world, we're talking about the things that really exist at every site. And, and oftentimes, you may not think about it because unlike the technical challenges, which are often data-driven, non-technical challenges are more the softer side of the, the things that we deal with at sites. Right? These are things like you know, determining site objectives, and then you have uh, changing site objectives or societal expectations on what you're going to achieve. Um, trying to apply green and sustainable remediation uh, best management practices. And then we look at managing these sites over long time frames, where you can have phased remediation occurring, um, changes in future use, or even changes in site management. On the regulatory side, you have federal and state cooperation, or lack thereof sometimes, which might occur. Changing laws and regulations. Orphan sites, which is not just a uh, uh, problem for um, you know, the uh, federal agencies, but state agencies as well have to deal with that particular issue because lack of financial resources can, can confound a cleanup. And then you have contaminants without regulatory guidance or criteria, which has historically been the issue uh, with PFAS, as, as many of you probably, probably are aware. Many states are, are struggling to find the right regulatory threshold uh, for addressing PFAS. And there's also additional discussion on, on some of these things, uh, these items in ITRC's green and sustainable remediation document. Here we have some additional non-technical items. Institutional controls. Now, tracking and managing or enforcing and the long-term management of institutional controls has often been a difficult task for, for any site in the United States. Uh, the systems typically are just not strongly inter embedded with regard to um, local and state agencies, so that you often can, can have um, uh, inappropriate actions that occur on a site where there's institutional controls and it's just unknowing. Uh, land use, or changing land use, or even water use, having multiple owners, or even site access. And funding, right, the lack of funds, and there can always be this issue of uh, of pull and stress on, on funds from a political influence. Uh, and we should know that you know, lack of funding is not is a problem for states as well. Um, you know, the, the states and, and federal agencies, you know, they often have to uh, allocate their funding for these sites, and, and it's not unlimited. And there's more examples uh, are discussed in the guidance. What also, I 
want to point out the inset photo. This is the Rocky Flat site in Colorado. Now, decades ago, I doubt many people would have thought of Rocky Flats in terms of becoming a wildlife refuge. Uh, but it has become that, and, and that creates a new challenge for land stewardship of this site over the uh, future. This is the Velsicol site in Michigan. Now, the reason I wanted to bring up this particular site is it's a site that was written by ITRC's uh, stakeholders on the, on the complex sites team. And I find this, this uh, particular case study to be really telling of not just the technical side of, cons of a site, but the non-technical. Back, uh, backdrop on this site is you had 40 years of chemical plant operations. And they left residual oil and fire retardants, pesticides like DDT, and low-level radioactive waste. Ultimately, um, these wastes ended up impacting water supplies and livestock. They affected residents' health. And of course, uh, the economy suffered as well. Uh, unfortunately, you had a financially distressed responsible party. And, and then you had the, the community itself so frustrated that they formed their own community action group and even wrote a book about their struggles. Now here, uh, they ultimately, the, the contaminants were removed. And remedial systems like pump and treat and slurry walls were installed and city water supplies replaced. But you know, despite all of these uh, multiple cleanup decisions, the regulators and community are still trying to define it, um, what success means at this site. And so when I look at this particular site, I have to ask, you know, how would you have approached this site? Would, it, would you look at the site saying, oh, this is a site that was completely driven by the, the technical challenges? Or would it be, in fact, that really the technical challenges were significant? But in fact, when you look at this site, it's really those non-technical challenges that drove to a decision to creating site objectives that could be achieved within a reasonable time frame. Just something to think about. And I definitely would uh, uh, have you look at this particular case study for, to get your, make your own opinion on it. Go back for a second. So before jumping to the next slide, I do want to mention that uh, when we talk about these non-technical challenges, they can extend beyond the technical aspects of a traditional conceptual site model. And because of this, uh, ITRC and, the, and this team, they recommend thinking about a paradigm shift here, where a conceptual site model integrates these non-technical challenges as well as technical. And with that, we kind of look on to um, how conceptual site models are built. Uh, you know, typically, they're just describing those technical characteristics. But we do recommend their balance between that uh, non-technical and, uh, and also account for, uh, account for these non-technical. Uh, and we can look to documents like NEPA, right, the National Environmental Policy Act, or in California, CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, which, which actually integrate stakeholder and other uh, non-technical challenges into the decision and, and setting of objectives. Now what you're seeing here in this, this particular diagram is US EPA's 2011 approach to developing a CSM, and we think it's pretty good. Uh, the approach establishes project milestones, and they're based on site knowledge and stakeholder input. And then they continuously refine the CSM based on new data and information. So the goal here is to develop a CSM with sufficient depth and clarity to accurately assess risks and develop appropriate remediation strategies. And to close the thought on the CSM is we really want a CSM that should be a dynamic tool and that's updated for those technical and non-technical considerations throughout the site's uh, life cycle. And before I, I hand it off to the next speaker, I want to summarize by giving you a few of the uh, lessons learned uh, as we, we looked at the site challenges. First, recognize that complex sites typically have multiple challenges. And it's both the technical and non-technical challenges that can impede remediation. And I, if you can identify these technical and non-technical challenges, you really can improve the conceptual site model and maximize the remedial effectiveness. And perhaps more importantly, you can help establish site objectives that can be achieved within a reasonable time frame. You know, one of the overarching considerations 
we encourage is seeking early stakeholder engagement and building consensus, especially around remedial timeframe predictions. You know, doing so can greatly reduce complications that often arise from non-technical challenges. So with all of that, it's time to learn how to quantify all this information. And I'd like to turn it over to my friend and introduce Dr. Charles Newell with GSI Environmental, who will discuss the remediation potential assessment. Chuck, over to you. Great. Well, thanks, Roy. Let's go ahead and dive in. And, and what uh, John started out with, he told us why we're here, why, why this interest in complex sites. And then, Roy, of course, you went through this, this uh, uh, great discussion of uh, this world that we live in, this remediation world. It's a challenging one for both these technical and non-technical issues. What I'm going to do is, uh, is sort of discuss this process, a process that's based on eight questions that informs you about the, this remediation potential assessment. Can you achieve these remediation goals in a reasonable time frame? And you'll learn how you, it's a very flexible. You have the option to protest the process, the data qualitatively or quantitatively. Uh, but first, let's go ahead and discuss the learning objectives you know, for this particular section. So here, we're going into chapter three. Here's this big flow chart. And this chapter three, this remediation potential assessment section talks about use this remediation potential assessment to identify whether adaptive site management is warranted due to site challenges. So the site challenges, of course, that's what Roy talked about, both these technical and non-technical. Uh, but this is where in the flowchart what we're really trying to answer. But there's some nuances to this. And, and one is that this is not a pure yes, no you know, answer. It's not just this line in the sand. It's ad adaptive. And, and that uh, you can use this information um, um, in different ways. If you get something where it says, well, maybe I don't need this adaptive site management, note at a particular site, like a simple site, it can be still be very helpful. So, but this is a way to try to put things in different bins, just what is my potential for really getting to this site uh, uh, objectives and getting them met. Mm -hmm. So now let's talk about um, the processes and outcomes. Uh, of the particular process. Here's a description. And on the process side, I'm going to talk about this screening tool. It uses this weight of evidence approach with these eight questions to assess if a site is likely to achieve remediation objectives in a reasonable time frame. Okay? But it's also this, it's a basis for aligning expectations about what you actually can do at a site, what the actual remediation potential is. And sort of an extreme example, a cartoonish example, consider two people that are stakeholders that are around the table. One person says, we've got to keep doing remediation until every last molecule of that contaminant is out. Pretty difficult, maybe possible to do. On the other hand, there may be somebody there that says, hey, we can't clean this site all the way up. Uh, let's just walk away. Let's just give up. Uh, that's on the other extreme. So the idea that this is a process where people sit around the table, they talk about the eight questions, and hopefully align those two extreme viewpoints into one that's, uh, that's in the middle so you can move forward with this thing. And that's this last part. It really promotes effective and transparent interaction about the whole thing. And, and then the outcome, your objectives are either attainable in terms of what you can do at the site, meet those remediation objectives, or the remediation potential is low. And that's when you, know, you really should consider this adaptive site management approach that's really the heart of this complex site documents. And so this is, goes through this flow chart that's in there. Again, note that even if you come out with this, uh, hey, I, I think I can meet these objectives, note that even simple sites, this adaptive site management approach can still be very helpful for you. So um, we're just presenting this whole um, process to help you sort of understand your site a little bit better. Now, to do that, maybe I'll go through a simple example of, of, of how you think about sites and how, these, how questions can be used to answer something. And this is something that actually happened to me. Uh, my brother-in-law had inherited a, 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 basically a gas station, and he knew there was some environmental work that had been done out there. And he wanted to know, uh, can they clean that site up? How much trouble am I in? And so, so if you uh, – thought experiment for everybody out there. If somebody called you up, your brother-in-law, and – what questions would you ask him about that site report? And, and for, so in this simple example here, let's just say this isn't the actual site for my brother-in-law, but uh, let's say that your friend called you up, and you, and you, after asking a series of questions, you figure out, well, it's a small, shallow site. It's got sandy water-bearing unit, not a lot of clay down there. Low concentrations, pretty close to the cleanup standards already. 
key contaminants, benzene, well, that can attenuate pretty fast in the subsurface. Hey, no, no mention of this non-aqueous phase liquid type material. So you might say, oh, this, this thing has got all the, the things aligned, the stars are aligned, that you can meet these remediation objectives, you're in good shape. And your friend's really uh, um, glad about this, you get a ham for Christmas, you know, so everything's great. But on the other hand, if the friend had described something else, and you ask these questions, and uh, you figure out, oh, this is, this is a pretty large site, and it's, oh, it's, all, it's pretty deep down there. A lot of this under our buildings, it's hard to get, uh, actually to drill, and to put injection wells in to clean this thing up. It's got sand, silt, fractured, fractured clays. There's no hint of biodegradation for this contaminant. And you need to go a long way, more than 99.9% .9 reduction. So you ask your questions and you learn this and you tell them, well, you need to be real careful about this. This could cost a lot of money. And of course, you make a note to yourself, don't loan this person any money. But this is just this uh, so example of sort of asking these heuristics, these questions. Um, can you uh, sort of uh, um, um, learn about the site? And then if people discuss this, come to an agreement about what, what the next step should be. How do you, how do you pursue this and, and apply this adaptive site management? Well, let's move on. And uh, so here's just some more before I go into the eight questions. Uh, here's the purpose again. It's intended to inform this remedial decision process. Um, determine if adaptive management process is beneficial. We want, this is uh, ideas to make it greater transparency, facilitate future reviews of the process. But note that even though I'm talking about these eight questions, it's flexible. So you can weight questions different ways. You can, you can use the information in different ways. So that's the other theme on this. In some ways, the, the idea is uh, um, there was a book about um, Steve Jobs, a, auto, a biography that was called The Journey is the Reward. And so that's the purpose of this, is to help people go on this journey. And there's this framework of these eight questions to help you sort of go down that road and, and, and come to an agreement about a site. So let's go through for full disclosure of uh, the mediation potential assessment, what it does and does not do. So first, uh, yeah, it's flexible, site-specific input. You use that this iterative process uh, to make all this stuff work. <clears throat> it does require detailed supporting data on the nature and the extent of the contamination. You need to know about your site. Uh, you can't just say there's a site out there with no characterization. You have to have this characterization information to sort of march through and answer these eight questions. It considers remediation potential of individual factors in the context of other pertinent factors. So <clears throat> there's these different factors that weights them all together. Mm -hmm. Now what it doesn't do, it doesn't means, provide a means to avoid requirements. If you say, no, I can't meet my objectives, and I'm going to walk away, no, that's the farthest thing away from our intention in this particular guidance in this particular method. It, it uh, does not evaluate whether a site is complex or not. We're really trying to get this to answer this question, hey, or should you go ahead in this complex site guidance and then go ahead and use that adaptive site management approach that we'll discuss after, uh, after I, uh, this section of the discussion right here. It doesn't directly consider cost, although cost is implicit in some of the eight questions, and I think you'll get a sense of that when we go through that. And finally, it doesn't pr provide a default decision. Oh, all sites are complex. Uh, no, no, we want to make this so th there's this range and you can apply it to your site and see what happens. Okay, well now maybe it's time to go to the eight sites. And again, the idea is uh, uh, I you answer the eight questions you can learn about your sites. Just it, it's uh, um, the way this worked in process is that everybody had their own set of, set of eight questions in the complex site team about about how you would define, you know, can I meet my objectives? Unfortunately, at the beginning, they were, they were different. People had a different set of eight. So we spent about a year, a year and a half going through them. And what you're seeing now is the results of a lot of discussions, a lot of interpretations from this entire team ending up with this distilled version of these eight key questions. Well, let's go ahead and see. I think the next slide is where we're going to go ahead and start. Question number one, how difficult is it to work at the surface of a site? And I'll just give you an example here. A uh, person calls back, hey, I've been out to the site, and it's a cow pasture. We're going to shoo away these cows. Uh, we can get our trucks out there. Hey, this is really easy. Um, we're just going to drill this. So you might say the way these questions work is you have to answer it as a high, a medium, or low that this particular factor gives you a higher likelihood of meeting your objectives. And a cow pasture would be high. Well, it's going to make it easier to characterize, easier to mediate. But if you're in a site here, it's in, oh, goodness, it's in the middle of the subdivision. There's uh, clearances out the kazoo. Uh, this is a tough thing. 
then while the cow pasture might be a high that it's going to help you achieve these objectives, this is going to lower your chances of getting those objectives because it's just going to be harder to drill. You can't drill in somebody's living room you know, and see something like that. So that's question one. Question two, how difficult is it to drill at the site? Well, you see it. It's all shallow. Hey, we can use hand augers. Okay, I'm going to give that a high. Okay, good news here. It's going to be cheaper to do. We can, we can do this. But if you sort of look at the topographic map and you say, uh, we got to get this really remote island, and oh, it's all fractured rock, and I got to go down hundreds of feet with our rotary, oh, that's going to be, that's going to be a low. So question two depends on how difficult it is to drill the site. And here are two extremes, a high on top and you'd say a low on the bottom. Okay, well, that's two of the eight. Let's keep going. Um, Roy mentioned a little bit about the size of the site not being the sole factor for seeing how complex it is, but it is one of the eight questions that surfaced from our year's work of coming up with these eight questions. And if you've got a, a site, tiny site that's maybe 10 foot by 10 foot, hey, it's the size of uh, the, the conference room in the, in the office, um, hey, it's going to be a lot easier to manage this and to do something. But then if the size goes up, um, let's say it goes up to 100 foot by 100 foot, this is maybe the size of an average site where institute treatment is, is, is performed, you know, a quarter of an acre, a third of an acre. Um, well, we've done sites like that. That's pretty, that's pretty uh, you know, doable. But, but then you get stuff that's a thousand foot by a thousand foot source zone in here. There's a longer plume. Oh, that's, that's going to be a low. That's, that's a bigger site. So this is the way you can put the scale of the source of the plume into your decision making and, and uh, understand what's going on. Okay, so that's question three. Now let's talk about question four, and it's uh, how far do you have to go? What contaminant concentration reduction do you need? So for example, if you are at the uh, highest concentration is 50 parts per billion of uh, TCE in groundwater, well, the MCL is only five. That's a 90% reduction. That's one ohm, one order of magnitude. Um, turns out if you're 90% or less, maybe that's not that far. Um, but if you get higher, 99% is going to be more difficult. 99.9% .9 is going to be even more difficult. If you got four nines, yeah, that's going to be a low. So then this is one way you can look at how far do you have to go to meet your, your concentration goals and you assign a high, medium, or low uh, for your site, for, for the key constituent that's out there. Okay, let's uh, halfway through, let's keep going on through the questions. Uh, net number five, do the C key site constituents readily attenuate relative to the travel time for the receptors? Well, let's say somebody says, what's the constituent? It's this guy. And so everybody may be looking at that. Um, uh, I'll, I'll estimate that about 98% of you guys know what that is automatically. You remember your organic chemistry. But I'll, I'll tell you, it's toluene. And it turns out that a lot of these uh, um, research that's done on biodegradation, particularly at the Bemidji crude oil site in, in, in Minnesota, this is the thing that went away first. It's the most biodegradable. So you'd say this, oh, I'm going to give this up. Oh, hi, I can, I can meet those objectives. I can do it. Um, but then if you have something like this, looking, anybody know what that is? Of course, that's, that's PCBs. Uh, those are more recalcitrant, harder to deal with. So it's all about attenuation. And you would, you would say high, medium, or low, or high is good. And low means it's going to make it more difficult to go here. So now we've got um, finally the last one. Does difficult to remove mass exist at the site? And this comes up with a big theme that's particularly sort of a, um, becoming a, a, an important um, concept in, in conceptual site models at corn and solvent sites is about matrix diffusion and other things, like how much NAPL is down there. But somebody calls back, hey, literally, this site's a sandbox. We'll move the kit. We'll move the buckets. And we can go in and drill. There's not going to be a lot of uh, diffusion into low permeability zones. This thing's real easy. But, so that's going to be a high. But if somebody says, uh, you know, um, it's like that green tank movie from uh, um, Colorado State University, Land Donor and Tom Sale. I don't know if, if any of you all have seen this. An amazing movie. It's a, it's a lab tank where each one of those things in the middle, it's, it's, it's a it's bentonite. It's clay. And they sent this green dye. And then over 23 days, this dye diffused into these clay layers. And then they turned off the, the, uh, this dye. And this is about day 24, day 25. And you can still see this dye. And now it's coming out of the clay layers. And this stuff persists for over 120 days. So if you have a site that has a lot of heterogeneity into it, it's, it's what I call the revenge of the geologist, the matrix diffusion 
may be important at your site, and you would say, oh, that's going to be a low. This matrix diffusion is going to be hard to overcome. And I think uh, Roy in, uh, talked about the, the case study team that was part of the complex site teams, the subgroup, and they came up with all these amazing case studies. And one of them is this site, uh, Paducah Gaseous Diffusion Plant in Kentucky. And I'm going to go through the first six questions just to talk about just an example of how you might apply um, the six questions of a site like this. And so we start out, number one, up there there's the surface access. Well, there's a building there, but maybe you could build through the building, so maybe you'd say it's a medium. You know, I'm just, I don't know the specifics about this site, so I'm just so, more or less trying to uh, describe how you might be thinking about some of these different uh, elements that are in there. So that's number one. The number two off the left, drilling difficulty. Well, you've got to go nine, nine, 90 feet. There's some gravel in there. Maybe that's going to be tough to do direct push. So maybe you're going to say, oh, that's medium or maybe low. It's going to be more difficult than at a very shallow site to, to get that information and to put in any sort of remediation work. Let's keep going. The scale, the source of the plume. I think this uh, plume here, it's um, um, roughly about 10,000 cubic yards, a little bit bigger than average maybe, but not that bad. So maybe that's a medium that's in there. Keep going. Concentration reduction. Um, at this particular site, um, looking at the concentrations that are there and the cleanup standards, you have to get four orders of magnitude, 99.99%. Oh, that would likely be a low if this was the actual uh, information at the site itself. Then we look at attenuation. Let's say these are chlorinated solvents. There's a little bit of cis-DC out there, but not, maybe not a lot. Um, um, you'd say that, well, maybe that's a medium. Maybe that's a low in terms of this case. And then finally, difficult to remove mass. So you can see here we do have this heterogeneity. There's likely matrix diffusion effects, so maybe that would be a low itself. So just trying to, each one of the questions, people would discuss and go back, look at the data that's collected, and assign it high, medium, or low. Let's keep going with the last two questions. And number seven is, what is the predicted performance for available remediation technologies? You know how far you have to go with that, that previous question, number four. What can you get out of uh, um, the existing technologies? And for this, we stand on the shoulders of giants. ITRC document 2011 has a lot of information about performance of our in-situ remediation technologies for chlorinated solvent sites. And so you could use that. There's some uh, great paper from Hans Stroh and a bunch of the ESTCP usual suspects that wrote this. And more recently, this is something that I worked on, ESTCP report about 235 sites, and it talks about what percent concentration reduction was achieved in these treatment zones where they did thermal or bioremediation? It turned out to be roughly on average about one order of magnitude, that some were higher, some were lower. But the, the idea is you would look through for your contaminant, for your hydrogeologic setting, how far do you think you could go? And um, if, you, if you can go several orders of magnitude, maybe give it a high. If it's less than that, maybe a low. So, so that's number seven. And of course, the, the document helps you make all these decisions. Number eight, what's the predicted time frame for achieving interim site objectives? And for this, we say maybe run some sort of model and just see how long it would take to get there to your endpoint. Here's the y-axis aqueous concentration and percent reduction. Here's years from 0 to 250 on the, um, on the, on the uh, y-axis, on the x-axis. And here's at one site, people are looking at if it's only in the fracture, if there's some biodegradation in the fractures. But the idea is you would run some sort of analysis. And it could be a simple log concentration versus time plot. And how, how far, if you extend that line, would it take to, to get to that MCL? Uh, but other tools that are out there, we talk about the US EPA REMCLOR or REMFUEL model are, are ones that can be used to help address questions about remediation time frame. Quick aside is the REMCLOR MD, REMCLOR Matrix Diffusion Model, was just released about four weeks ago. So you can go to the ESTCP webpage or just look for REMCLOR MD, and that new model is now available. There's the other software, the Natural Attenuation Software from the USGS, a great tool. Matrix Diffusion Toolkit, or like I say, just concentration versus time or first order rate calculations, you can do all that. So those are the, are the eight questions. And so um, we're just going to now talk about how you'd wrap this up. You'd evaluate each criteria as high, moderate, or low. And it's, it's the likelihood of achieving remediation objectives. Is it high, moderate, or low? And in this case, you can put checks in all the eight questions. You, you, if you wanted to, you could weight some criteria more than others. And you assess the conclusion. And as an optional step, we say here, you could add up all the high checks, the moderate and the low. This would be four, two, and two. And you say, well, based on this weight of evidence,
confidence, maybe it is, maybe I can achieve those objectives, that's high. But then if you go through another example, let's just say that this is another site, access is moderate, you know, maybe there's a building in the way um, that's be hard to drill through, the drilling feasibility, maybe it's shallow, or we're going to say it's high, it's a pretty big site, maybe we'll say it's moderate here, concentration reduction, you've got to go four nines, I'm going to call that low. Attenuation, there's just a little bit, uh, so maybe we're going to say that's moderate, a lot of matrix diffusion in this, this hypothetical site, we'd say it's low. Technology performance, I don't see a lot of sites that can get all that stuff out of those clays. Um, so a lot of technologies, so our, our case studies, so maybe we'd do that low. And then time frame, well, I ran an M4MD and it's a long time. So in this case, it would be say one, three, four with the lows getting. You say, I think that, um, that the likelihood of achieving remediation objectives is low. And what this then says is keep reading the complex site document. Mike Truex is going to talk more about this and use adaptive site management. I think I just got two slides left, and the, the next one is just just uh, this other thing is that well, there's also a section in this that um, we're talking about. Um, um, hey, I've already started my remediation of the site. So how can I use this for that? And there's just some additional questions. Has the existing remedy been effectively operated and maintained? Can that give you good information? representative information about, um, about how difficult it is to clean up. Have you really characterized everything well? You know, has anything changed in your conceptual site model? Are concentration reductions occurring at the rate anticipated? If you had some sort of glide path that was predicted, are you above it or are you below it? So that's, that's how you would assess or, or, or utilize this great information from this operating remediation system that's been going on. And then does the selected remedy address the contaminants or hydrologic conditions that are out there? And then finally, can interim or site objectives and these contaminant-specific cleanup levels be met with other technologies if your current technology is not going to get you there within a reasonable time frame? So let me just wrap up, and we're just going to do a summary. Hey, this is a screening tool. It provides a valuable process. It doesn't come up with this default decision. It's you take that site-specific information, the stakeholders, they process it, and they come up with these checks, and then they can do it. You answer these eight technical questions. You can use this weight of evidence approach to assess, is the site likely to achieve remediation objectives? It allows flexible, uh, flexibility, site-specific input, and it's an iterative process. And in the end, you say, oh, I think, yeah, these site objectives are likely attainable. Or, no, no, that, there's a lot out there. This remediation potential is below. And what the complex site document says, use adaptive site management that, that Mike Truex will be talking about. That's going to be really important for you to, to manage these, this very complex situation that you have out there. And so that's it uh, for this section. I think now um, we go to uh, some questions and answers. Thanks, Chuck, for taking us through that remediation potential assessment key criteria. We do have time for questions and answers. So at any point, anyone is um, able to send us questions by clicking in that Q&A pod in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submitting a question in writing. In just a moment, I'll give our phone line audience an opportunity to ask their questions verbally. And to ask a question verbally, we'll need you to unmute hitting pound six. Uh, before we get to those questions, just a reminder, if you're someone who needs a certificate of participation or information to assist you with documenting continuing education credits, at the end of today's training, you can fill out the online feedback form. Once you complete that form, there's a box for you to check at the end of that form to certify you participated today. Once you click on that and press submit, a certificate of participation will be generated for you. So let's go to our phone line audience. If you have a question for our trainers, make sure you hit pound six to unmute and go ahead and ask your question. Any questions from the phone lines? All right, we'll go to one of our written questions and it says, so far mainly terrestrial complex sites have been discussed. Is there any difference when dealing with complex aquatic sites, such as marine, riverine, or lacustrian sites? And can you provide examples of such sites you would qualify as complex? 
Yeah, hey, thanks, Mary. I'll go ahead and jump in here. This is John Price. Um, actually, two of our case studies uh, deal with you know multiple media. The Onondaga Lake uh, case study is a really interesting case study where you know they've got groundwater and soil contamination like you'd expect, and also the contamination is out in the lake. And then also um, in the introduction, I talked about the Naval Air Station Jacksonville case study, and uh, I think they've got some issues in the marine environment as well. So I, I'd recommend that the um, uh, person take a look at those case studies. And this is Chuck. I'll just, just I'll just dive in and just sort of augment that a little bit. Is that in terms of this remediation potential assessment, these eight questions. Uh, in some ways, they're fairly generic. The questions themselves um, that they could be applied to different types of settings, such as you know sediment sites or something like that. Some of the detailed information that describes each question is, is pretty focused on you know um, I think this terrestrial you know ha uh, you know uh, contaminated site you know that to, in terms of the cubic yards that are typical and things like that. But but the idea of the questions are adaptable and you could change them. But uh, but a lot of the the eight questions I think have will have a a counterpart if you're doing some other type of site that's, say, in sediments or, or rivers or something like that. All right, thank you. We'll move on to another question. Is this, how do you deal with low permeability sites? Well, this is Chuck. I'll, I'll, I'll start again with sort of a, and then the others can, can pitch in here, is that when you go through the this section that I did, this remediation potential assessment, that's one of the eight questions. and so. It's not a it's not a question that would say that it triggers it's a, a default and says no you got to stop you can't clean this site up it's one of the eight that we'll be looking if you have a very small site then excavation is one way that you could do a small shallow site so so there are different ways of handling it but on a bigger note this is something that I've spent a lot of my recent career on is that it is something that is a, is a very difficult way to uh, a difficult thing to overcome that if we're doing injection based technologies it's just hard to get that stuff on those clays and so there's some high level themes uh, there's a CERTUP report um, a, a sort of a, a, a state of the science report that uh, that I was a co-author in and we talk about what does all this low permeability stuff means in some ways it means you've, you're going to it's going to take longer to, to achieve cleanup standards we may be doing more containment for some sites um, and that uh, you just have to know about how you deal with this stuff. Uh, uh, that it, it should be part of your conceptual site model so you don't get surprised when, say, some sort of a remedy underperforms. A lot of research in this area. There's a lot of really clever ideas coming out, um, but one of the key challenges for our business. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chuck. Do any of the other trainers want to add into that? All right, let's move on to another question. It says, at what time is in the CERCLA process would you do the remedial potential assessment? Well, this is Chuck. I'll, I'll uh, start out and, and say, well, this is something where we'd say you'd want to do this after you have some of your site information. And so if you've not done a really thorough remedial investigation, then, then then maybe it would be during that period or after that period um, that you could do this. But it's also you could apply this after remedies have been in place and you want to sort of take that information. There's a section in the document about thinking about, about this uh, um, assessing can your existing technology, you know, achieve those objectives, looking at what it's done in the past. And so, so those are two different places. So I think maybe one answer is in different places uh, that, that it could fit in. Mm -hmm. And Mary, this is Roy. I, I can add to that. And um, you know, the Superintendent Task Force is, is in the process of, of updating their guidance on adaptive management, which uh, ironically uh, overlaps quite well with the uh, complex sites guidance. And I think their the idea being to look for ways to, to reconsider sites that uh, historically have not progressed uh, with the speed to that either the responsible party or the agencies would have liked, or even stakeholders for that matter. So in that regard, I, I think you'll start seeing EPA regions becoming more um, uh, interested in using various tools to help them understand uh, opportunities to perhaps take a site down a different path, which is what the 
radiation potential assessment uh, provides that uh, tool to use. All right, let's move on to another question. It says, realizing that this is based on the scale or scope of the site, in your experience, what has been the incremental cost of working the process itself? Well, Mr. Chuck, I'm not sure I completely understand the, the parsing of the answer. So it's just working the actual process of doing the eight questions. It wouldn't affect your analysis that much in terms of, of doing this information. And, and, um, but, but that one of the questions is about scale. And so, so you would have to have done a characterization where you have some sense of the, you know, in, in the United States, it's cubic yards or cubic meters of affected material in, in sort of a source zone. What, how big is that plume? Um, and so, um, so that's, that's one thing. In terms of, we, we talked about adding a cost question in the end, we didn't do it. It's implicitly in that scale question, but there's this idea that, that if for different technologies, um, you have different cost versus remediation cost versus t scale problems. So some of them, it's, it's almost linear, you know, that excavation, a small excavation is going to be similar in terms of, it's going to be scaled up to the cubic yards you have to do. Um, a thermal project has a sort of a big setup procedure, a, a big MOBE cost, but once you do that, so then, so the, the cost versus remediation cost versus scale, it's different for different technologies. And so in our process here, we're just asking, just you give us some idea of the scale and is it big, medium, or, or is it high, medium, or low in terms of is that going to uh, impact you trying to um, reach your, your remedial objectives? Right. The next uh, question, it says, it seems that sometimes just one of the eight factors, if it happens to be low or very low potential for successful remediation, it can drive the site score and as an overall low remediation potential site. And they're just kind of looking for your thoughts on that, if that's kind of a true assessment, if you do have one factor that's very low, if that drives the, the rest of the process. Right, and so we talked about that quite a bit in our deliberations, you know, when we were writing the document and, and people had different opinions. They, there was one idea, well, if question five is, if question, uh, you know, number uh, six is low, then maybe that should just o over trump everybody else, supersede it, right? And we said, no, we, we don't want to do that. And now people can, in their weighting of this, say, well, I think that, that my low my difficult to remove mass is the key factor at this site, so I'm going to I'm going to double the number of checks that it gets. I'm going to weight it more than the other questions um, in there. But but we we say that it's very adaptable and stakeholders can adjust it that way. But the plain vanilla approach that we have in here is is each of the eight are are uh, the starting point is uh, the simple approach. All eight are weighted equally, and uh, but but that stakeholders can look at this and and say, assign one of these uh, a lot more weight than the others. Right. I think that's all the questions we have for now. We will go ahead and move into the second portion of our presentation. Just a reminder that you can write those questions in that Q&A pod at any time, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can in the second question answer period as we wrap up today's training. So I'm going to go ahead and move us on over to slide number 54. And the next section is on adaptive remedy selection. And I'll turn it over to Mike Truex with the Pacific Northwest Environmental Laboratory. Mike, take okay. it from there. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, so we've heard about some of the types of challenges that might be at a site and, and how you might think through the difficulty it, that those might pose and how to remediate a site. And so if you get to that point where you've gone through these uh, exercises, you may say, well, hey, we want to we wanna apply an adaptive remedy approach. And, and the first step in that is if you're going to use an adaptive remedy approach, you have to say, well, how am I going to select this remedy? So that's sort of your planning stage. And, and it's important to know that, you know, of course, you're still going to follow either circular or regress procedures. But what this document really talks about are some of the nuances you have to think about try and understand and apply adaptive site management principles on top of those processes. So we're going to give you some things to think about as you move through that um, remedy selection process in this planning phase. And you see here in the, um, where this sits in the flow chart are these, these sort of light blue boxes. And so we've got three kind of key steps that you have to think about as you go through and, 
in this remedy selection process, and, and we want you to pay particular attention to these because of the characteristics of these more complex and challenging sites. And one other thing to notice about this flow chart is that these three boxes of the planning, of course, lead into your implementation, but there are arrows back into this. So it's really important as you go through this planning to do it in a um, rigorous way, uh, document it, because you might have to come back to this planning process again as you find out things about your site. And so we're going to uh, talk through those now and, and see what sort of nuances you might need to consider. But first, let's pull up a poll question uh, here, Mary. And, and you might ask, well, you know, you may get into this process in different ways. So one of the questions is, well, did you have a remedy at your complex site that might have failed? You know, what, 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 uh, what happened, you know, where you, where you couldn't move forward? And that might be one reason where you, where you come into this process. And, and then you say, well, how do I address that failure? And, of course, you can see some of the different types of options that are out here, optimization and contingencies and more site characterization. And, and you can see there's kind of a, a broad spectrum of different types of answers that are coming in that, that look at, well, there are different ways to um, approach a situation when you when you can't meet those expectations. And so this adaptive site management is sort of an overarching way to, to deal with um, when you have a remedy that's um, either one projected not, at the onset projected not to be successful, or if you've started some things and, hey, they're not working out, well, maybe you should go back and do some additional planning in this more rigorous fashion. So let's move to the next slide and kind of start talking about this. You can pull that uh, poll down now. So the first uh, box that we had where we wanted to think about this was um, refining the conceptual site model. And, and of course, you know, you've likely already got a conceptual site model at your site, but if you're going to say, hey, I've got some challenges and I know I'm going to have some difficulty with remediation, you want to make sure that that conceptual site model really articulates what those site challenges are and if you started remediation, what has inhibited it. We need to get that down on paper and then identify those data gaps. And the reason we're doing this is because we want to focus our planning on those factors that are going to be most important for success. So what was inhibiting you and what are your challenges? So let's figure out how to address those. And one of the things you need to do is, of course, have some tools that associate with that. And um, in many cases, you may need to go back and, and gather some additional information to better articulate what those challenges or those factors are that you're going to have to address. And so there's some good resources. And in our um, document, we point to things like the integrated DNAPL site characterization tools um, documents. It's got some really good information. And there's some other resources in there that say, hey, if you know you have some issues and you need to find out more about them, here's some ways that you can do that. So that refining the conceptual site model is important. And you really need to think about, well, how am I going to present that to all the decision makers and the stakeholders involved. And so here's an example of a case study in Australia. And what they did is they kind of used this uh, multi-component model to talk about where, where do I really need to target my work here. And so th if you note, they've got different phases they've identified, vapor, denapel, groundwater, and sorbed. they got different areas, the source, the proximal plume, and the distal plume. And then they looked also at this permeability and transmissivity. We know that that's a big factor. And, and sort of the mobility of contaminants and the success in remediation. So they identified low and high zones. And then they looked at where their mass was, right? And they've got some places where they have high mass and sort of moderate mass and then, and then low mass. And so now they've kind of, in a way, taken their site information and put it in a form where they can say, OK, now I know where I'm going to have to target and where I'm going to have to spend my most resources. So this is just one idea of ways to um, articulate your conceptual site model in terms of those important factors for moving forward with your planning. So um, there's some other examples in the document. But what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to that next step. So after we've got some better articulation of our problem, we're now going to have to set or, or revisit those site objectives. So what does that mean? So the site objectives, those are your overall target. That's the, that's the end point that you want to get to. And when you think about that, if you have these challenges with a site, you need to think, well, what are those site objectives going to be? What are we really going to be able to achieve here? And so you may have had those set already, and you may have to revisit those. This is a, this is a major conversation that the site's going to need to have, because of course we need to be protecting the public health and the environment, but we need to set what those objectives are going to be that we can reasonably uh, anticipate that we're going to achieve. And in setting those, we have to consider those complexities, and of course, we may not be able to set this for the whole site as, as in its entirety. We might say, well, you know, for 
maybe this distal plume we can achieve a certain uh, set of objectives, but maybe that source area is going to be different, so you can set this up in different site segments. And again, you may be doing this at the onset of, of, of coming to a site after you have some RI data and you've, you've got some information to know that you have these challenges, or you may have done some remediation and say, hey, I really have to revisit this because my progress is, is not what I need it to be and, and I can't really optimize it. So let's kind of revisit where, where we should be targeting here. Again, maybe for the whole site or in these site segments. So there's a couple things to think about when we set those site objectives, and we'll talk about this for some of the different regulatory programs. And part of these are there are regulations out there that we have to follow. And of course, for CERCLA, we have to protect human health and the environment, and we have to meet our ARARs. And so we've got a poll question here. If you want to pull that up now, we'll kind of talk about that. And that says, well, while we know that these are overarching sort of goals under CERCLA, there are these processes called ARAR waivers. So we're going to talk a bit about this. So we were wondering if any of you have used ARAR waivers. And it looks like uh, maybe a small percent of you have looked at it. And then um, what kind of approach was selected? Well, ARAR waivers looks like a few people. Um, but most people really haven't explored these. And, and so this is an opportunity to maybe think about, well, what is what are your options out there when you're dealing with a site where meeting these more absolute regulations will be more difficult. So let's drop that poll off now, and we'll kind of look at what these ARR waivers are under CERCLA. So you can see there's a number of, of waivers, um, inconsistent uh, application of state, state standards, fund balancing, equivalent performance. Those are some factors that might be applied to different types of sites. Now we're going to get down to ones that might really relate to some site challenges. So you might have to think about interim measures, because this site is so challenging that we can't quite envision that final state yet. Uh, you might talk about greater risk. Has this site got a lot of problems that if you do something, you're actually going to cause more problems than you solve? So that might be one to think about. And then, of course, technical impracticability is one that people may have heard of. Um, that's one where you say, look, we've looked at all the engineering solutions, and you know, there's not one out there that's going to really be practicable to reach our goals. And so let's explore that a little bit more with a, a case study. And technical impracticability, um, is a, is a way that you look at your site, and you have to have a lot of information to support this. So if this case study site, it's a, a wood treatment facility. It's got uh, recalcitrant creosote and pentachlorophenol D-napple. It's in a drinking water aquifer. And so there's a lot of challenges. And what they did is they did a lot of good site characterization. They did a lot of treatability tests, right, because they had to look at whether or not there was a technology that would work. And what they decided was, well, you know what, we can reach our goals for this longer plume here that we have out in groundwater. But this, this particular source zone, we're just not going to be able to get to the drinking water standard here. So what they did is they said, OK, well, let's set up our approach where we're going to meet goals for the plume, and we're going to set up a specific technical impracticability zone. And within that zone, we're going to do containment, because we've got to contain this source, but we know we can't do restoration. So they had a lot of evidence on why that was necessary, and then they, when they went out and looked at the site, again, they used this concept of site segments so they could come up with a reasonable um, approach that was as protective as possible for uh, people in the environment, but yet took into account these challenges with remediation. So uh, under CERCLA, there are those ARR waivers. There's also this uh, another approach called alternative uh, concentration limits, and so that's for the situation where um, you have some very specific criteria. One is where groundwater is discharging to surface water, so it's those type of sites. And it also says that that discharge is not causing harm, essentially, downstream in that surface water body. So you, you've reached that condition where that's not going to be a problem, because you don't want to be transporting this problem downstream. And it also that because you're really thinking about concentration limits based on that surface water discharge, that you're not going to have exposure to that groundwater um, off-site. So nobody's going to have that pathway of groundwater exposure. So this is a particular type of um, additional option to think about for sites. Now, we did not identify any recent case studies. So you won't see any case studies in the document, but it is out there as a potential approach to consider when you have those difficulties in, in meeting the, the more um, prescriptive regulations. So RECRA and other state programs, we did kind of an interesting thing here with the building the document is we went out and we surveyed states about their types of um, alternatives um, approaches for, um, for complex sites and what sort of waivers or other approaches could be used. So we looked at these surveys for these sorts of 
um, situations. We got responses from 40 states, so pretty good response to our survey. And what we asked them, we said, we gave them a list of different types of waivers or other approaches, alternatives they might um, uh, include. And they said, do you allow those as part of a primary means to address the site, or do you allow those after a site uh, remedy might fail? And here's some of the answers we got. So here you see, you know, we've got 40 sites that responded. So now you can look and say, well, look, risk-based criteria, 38 states said that that was a possibility. Uh, 36 states said you can use institutional controls to manage uh, exposure, designated points of compliance, alternative concentration limits, TI provisions, and low threat closure criteria. All of those are a pretty reasonable number of states allow those sorts of, of approaches. Again, you still have to justify those, and we're not necessarily advocating that you should use these, but they are options for you. So as we have a challenging site, we might need to consider what are the flexibilities in terms of setting our objectives, and these are some options that you might want to consider. So now we've talked about this idea of um, you know, our conceptual model and our site uh, objectives. Now we have to think about this whole planning process. How do we set our plan to go forward and, and, the, and the related remedy selection? And, and for that, we're going to think about interim objectives, which, is our, which are our steps along the way, and our adaptive remedial strategy that goes with, with that. And so the idea here is you know, some sites that are more simple, kind of like a cherry tomato, you can just eat that all in one bite, and that's all fine, but with a complex site, it might be more like an apple where you've got to kind of take it a bite at a time. And so that's where this idea of interim objectives are. And so let's pull up the poll question here and kind of talk through um, uh, different types of objectives. So we've talked about site objectives, and we've talked about or we're going to introduce these interim objectives. So when you talk about restoring groundwater to beneficial uses, is that a site objective or is that an interim objective? And you can see folks are kind of saying, well, yeah, that's a site objective. That's an ultimate goal, right? So if we talk about an objective that might say, well, we're going to reduce our mass flux by 50% in five years, you know, do you see that as an interim or a site? And uh, as, as we see here, most people are answering correctly, that's an interim objective. So that's a, a good example where that interim objective is that kind of clear step along the process. So let's drop that poll off and we'll kind of talk about these. And we're kind of borrowing from the ITRC's um, uh, integrated Dean Apple site strategy document. They talked a lot about these SMART objectives, make something that's specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound, something that I know when I've reached it. And so that's something you can use as a step along the way to your ultimate, ultimate objective. So there you see something like mass flux reduction, target degradation rates, or maybe a very specific action that's very clearly identified as when you've reached that. Those might be example, examples of smart objectives. They're going to help us because they're going to give us these steps along the ways that, that help us optimize against those clear metrics, and they might help us when we say, OK, as I, as I begin to reach those interim objectives, now I can think about, well, what's my next step? What's that transition going to look like? We've, a, we've planned that out, but now we've gathered this information about how well that first step worked that will inform us as to how we might want to think about or modify that next step. So and a key is that if you're setting interim objectives and you're meeting those, you're making progress at your site. And so that's an important thing at a complex site to say, hey, we are moving in our way on our way towards being protective for people and the environment. So that's the idea behind interim objectives. And so once you set those, you have to say, well, what am I going to do to achieve those? And of course, there's lots and lots of options out there. And this document, we went out and we gave you a listing of all these different types of approaches you might consider. These are sort of your, your building blocks you might think of in terms of how you can build a strategy to achieve your objectives. And, and of course, there's a lot of good information out there. Sites like Cluein uh, is, is, is a really fantastic resource. But for some of these, we went ahead and we listed some other resources that you might consider here where we thought, well, here's some additional things you might want to think about, especially for these complex sites where you might be going outside the box of traditional remedies and thinking about uh, more nuanced applications and combined remedy applications. So we give you some information about that in the document. And then, of course, those building blocks have to be assembled into remedial alternative, alternatives. And you might think about having several different options for those. And then you have to, you have to um, have some criteria for selecting. Well, what's my best approach? What's that best remedial alternative? And in this case, that means what's your best plan, your adaptive plan, your combination of technologies that you think you're going to follow to meet your ultimate uh, overall site objective. 
So we're going to follow CERCLA, but we really need to, in that process, or, or, or the related RECRA uh, process, you're really going to need to think about maybe some additional things things beyond just this, the standard nine criteria. And these are kind of these nuanced things. Well, so one thing might be, how does each of these remedial approaches address the complexities that you identified? Remember, we asked you to do that as part of your uh, conceptual site model. So that's something to think about when you uh, weigh these. You might think about some other things. How confident you are you in that approach to implement this remedy, given those site challenges that are present? Are things are these remedies synergistic? This is really important because if you have a combination of technologies, you want to know that they're going to play well together, and that you're not going to do one thing and it's going to give you problems for the next step. Are you going to be adaptable over time? That's going to be important. Um, are you going to get some information as you uh, apply these that's going to help you with your future decision? That's that whole idea of can you help yourself optimize or refine your plan over time? Um, are you, are these going to be uh, robust in terms of um, going towards those inter objectives, and are you going to have good ways to measure this um, against your metrics? And then you may come up with other types of considerations that might be specific to your site. And the key point is here, you know, sometimes you're comparing apples and apples because you want to say, yeah, one, one, one metric is, is enough to compare these. But when you have these challenges, you might say, well, you know what? To meet the challenges at my site, an orange might be better than an apple, even though they, you know, in a traditional sense, might be the same. So it's that's the kind of thing we're after: is what do you really need at your site to meet your challenges, and how do you incorporate that into your circle or RECRA type um, uh, remedy evaluation to select your your preferred alternative? The other factor you need to think about here is again getting down to this idea of a complex site may have multiple zones, and in fact, you may have some different objectives. Uh, associated with it. So you might need to kind of think about this in terms of a matrix, different objectives, different zones, the source and the plume, and different mixes of contaminants that might meet those objectives. So here's an example of the Rocky Mountain Arsenal site in Colorado. And one of the uh, remedy components there was, uh, was a surface uh, cover. But what actually they had was this whole system of remedies that went against their different um, went towards their different site objectives. So they had some source removal objective and treatment. They had containment. And they had overall protection of human health and the ecology. And you can see they have both an on-site and an off-site portion. And now you can look at how they had these um, bun this bundling of different types of remedy combinations that addressed each of those areas. And for a site that's, that has challenges and it's complex, you may need to think about your remedies in more of this matrix form as opposed to just a traditional hey, my remedy is um, technology A, and I apply that till I'm done. Well, that's not really the case here for a complex site. So uh, th those are all the aspects that we kind of talk about in terms of um, setting about your plan. And because it is a plan, and you know that you're going to have to use it over time, then it's a good idea to document that plan. Because you know, as people retire or move on, you need to have this well documented so you can articulate how each of these components are going to work together. You make sure you really clearly identify what technologies you plan on using and what those interim objectives are, and very importantly, how you're going to measure those so you know how you're doing over time. And of course, you have to follow your regulatory uh, requirements for doing that. And, but it's, again, important because along the way, you're going to need to make some decisions about transitioning your remedy from step one to step two. So it's not just about putting a bunch of big binders on your shelf. It's about really setting out a plan that the site owners and regulators and stakeholders can all see over time so they can manage this site, because it's an adaptive site management. right? So we have to have a, a good documentation for that plan. The other aspect that, we're, that we want to bring up here is we're talking about this planning period now, where we're looking at selecting the remedy. And that's a time when stakeholders and tribal perspectives really need to get integrated into this. So you'll note in the document, we spent a good amount of time talking about stakeholder and tribal input and, and getting those uh, values and concerns and getting organized and, and figuring out some way that you can um, interact with a site is a really important thing. And this planning period is an important time to think about doing that. And similarly, for the site, you need to recognize that this is a time in the planning stages. After you've got, gathered some site information and now you're deciding what to do, this is a good time to start figuring out how are we going to seek out and integrate that stakeholder in, input into this plan. 
And so the document talks about this. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but we really want to stress the importance of this because this really facilitates the ability to move through the process and come up with an acceptable plan uh, for all those involved. So I'm going to give, give a little summary here. And so what we talked about was the importance of refining the conceptual site model. Again, focus that mo conceptual model on those things you have to pay attention to. So that's that's a big part. We talked about setting a re setting um, site objectives. And so we did highlight some uh, flexibility that, that might be out there. And maybe that will be appropriate for a, a given complex site. Again, we're not advocating for those sorts of things, but we want to make you aware because they may be appropriate in consultation with uh, the site regulators. And then this idea of building the adaptive remedial strategy. Again, think about that as maybe different from another site where you have to really think about multiple technologies and phasing um, for the sites. You're going to have to really focus on how you're going to achieve uh, interim objectives. And then remember, this is a plan. You need to write this down. And you might have to come back to it. So if you remember that flow chart, there are some feedback lines. And so this overall process is an important sort of center point of the adaptive strategy because it says, here's how we're going to embark. But remember, we know there's some uncertainties out there. We're going to learn things along the way. So make sure that you have some ability to build in that those feedback loops into the process. And so with that, um, I think we're ready to move on to now how you implement this in long-term management. And so uh, I'll have uh, Sam Brock take over from here. Thank you, Mike. Um, we'll talk now about Mike has gone through and, and explained to us how to evaluate the site, how to develop an adaptive management plan, the importance of writing it down, and the purpose of long-term management now is to execute the plan that Mike has just explained how we created. We have to execute that now. And how do I do the advance the slide part? Hang on. I've got a technical glitch. Sam, if you'd like, I could advance the slides for you. Well, I've got to get to where I can see um, my computer blacked out. Well, we'll go. I'll do it with my paper copy, Mary, if you'll advance them. I want to go to slide 78. Uh, we want to talk about developing the long-term management plan. And as Mike pointed out, um, these sites are going to take an extended period of time. Um, we'll have various people and various successes and failures during that time. And it's important to have a record of what we intended to do so that we can stay on the, the process over a period of decades. Let's go to slide 79. If we look at the adaptive management um, flowchart here, we're looking at the, the dark blue where we have three tasks that we have to accomplish, the planning, the design and implementation, and then the periodic evaluation. And these process steps pretty much focus on our understanding of the site, the site characteris characteristics, and our ability to track progress toward change. They, the chart also identifies a series of decisions that we have to make that relate to, are we making progress? Are there adaptions, adaptations that need to be made in order to make our progress better? Or do we come to a point where we have to make a decision about a change in remedial approach? Let's go to slide 80. So why do we do the plan? Um, it's important to stay on, on script. Um, it helps us identify weak links. Where are the areas of uncertainty in our, our anticipated performance of our plan? Uh, this is important to keeping decision makers on the same page and, and, and informing uh, about progress and, and when decisions need to be made. And it's a valuable communication tool for engaging stakeholders. And we want to provide a, a coherent strategy that we can follow over decades we need to document remedy expectations. What do we expect each component of the remedy to accomplish? And what's the time, or how long would it take for that, that change to occur? We want to develop our planning so that we can evaluate uh, remedy performance expediently when it's time to do so. 
And this, in turn, is necessary to inform when we need to make transitions in our approach or implement different phases of the cleanup that we've planned. And we want to do all of this in a timely fashion. If something's not working, the quicker we get on to replacing an ineffective technology with another approach, the better off we are. Slide 81, please. The components of the plan include the completion strategy, a description of the selective remedy, and that remedy description needs to be broken into uh, segments of the site and different technologies that match specific objectives that have been identified for each of those technologies. And Mike, I think, showed us that approach on about slide 70. Um, we need a timeline for when we're going to do monitoring, as well as when we're going to do performance evaluations. And we need to know the criteria about how we're going to make those evaluations when the time arrives. Uh, we need decision logic for remedy transitions when, that, when we have a multi-phase remedy or when we determine that our approach uh, requires some adaptive modification. We also want to address project uncertainty or project risk, or what is the risk of um, project failure. And we have a, a document on how to do that that we'll talk about in a moment. At slide 82, um, we want to describe the completion strategy. We've talked about the importance of um, specifying the site objectives. Um, we understand going in that these are likely to be iterative. We're going to, some are going to work. Some are going to work better than others. Uh, we're going to have some that, um, that underperform. To arrive at these decisions and approaches is a collaborative process that, that in, requires the, a multidisciplinary team to address all the nuances that need to be considered. Um, this allows us to adapt to uh, changes in land use. And of course, we want to uh, consult relevant guidance. And Chuck likes to talk about standing on the shoulders of giants. And as Mike was describing the ITRC adaptive management process, um, ITRC is an example of, of adaptive process in the, in the series of remediation guidance documents that they put out over the years where we start off with a level of knowledge uh, that's studied and, and documented that leads to learning about new approaches. And that leads us, in turn, to the guidance documents that we refer to in this uh, document about the integrated Dean Apple site schedule, the remediation risk management guidance. And, and these guidance documents are a wealth of information that, in an iterative process, allow us to go back and, and look at developing the detail we need to make our, our site projects go forward. At slide 83, uh, we've talked about project uncertainties and managing the risk of those project uncertainties. And I want to recall your attention to the uh, RRM1, ITRC's uh, guidance document on project risk management, which provides a series of tools to help you identify um, project risks, to assess them, um, helps to identify contingency actions, to mitigate actions. And as we get into complex sites and adaptive management, um, there's going to be recurring periods of detailed investigation or reevaluation of, of the decisions that we've made previous. And this is all part of our contingency planning. The, the degree of contingency planning, if we have a fair amount of knowledge, we might be able to say, well, I'm afraid it's going to fail because of matrix back diffusion. Well, what are my options? that if I observe matrix back diffusion that I could implement. In other cases, it'll be um, a, a new um, uncertainty that uh, we'll just have to go back to process in section four that Mike described and figure out what to do about it. At slide 84, um, we want to describe the selected remedy. Um, Mike has addressed that for us. We go to slide 85. And we see, again, the description of the remedy, what the different objectives of the remedy are going to be, the technology selected to affect those objectives. And in the third column, we see that we're bringing forward the performance metrics, implementing the SMART concept of 
specific measurable attainable objectives that allow us to measure progress in a reasonable period of time. Without those metrics, it's difficult to say whether our remedy is working or not working. At slide 86, the concept of, of achievable objectives brings us to the, to the importance of a performance model. And a performance model is a graphical description of the expected change that we anticipate being produced by the technology that we're implementing. And we need an amount of change or a reduction in concentration, and we need to have some idea of what the time frame that we expect to see all or at least a portion of that change in concentration to occur in. And we'll refer to this picture again on, uh, in a couple of slides. We come back to the performance evaluation. And part of our plan is to execute and then to actually do the performance evaluation. And to do a performance evaluation requires that we have considered our, our site monitoring requirements to where we have analytical data from site media, as well as, as data from different components of engineered or passive remedial approaches. And we need to lay out how we're going to evaluate those data in order to um, evaluate the performance of those technologies that we've deployed. And those evaluations need to be scheduled. I think there's a survey here, isn't there, Mary? Um, but at a minimum, we need to do a performance evaluation for circle sites in, co in coordination with the five-year review. Uh, those frequencies can be increased or decreased according to the nature of the contamination and the expected effect of, of the remedial approach, and they may need to be speeded up or slowed down a little bit. We want the monitoring program to be aligned with the performance objectives, and this requires a very thoughtful application of the DQO process so that we know what we start with the decisions about remedy performance that we have to make. Um, we want to make sure that we have the data to answer the questions necessary to inform those decisions. We're going to look at decisions related to plume dynamics, to technology performance, and the performance evaluation may also shed insight on whether our conceptual site model is sufficiently robust or whether we need to refine our understanding of the site through um, perhaps high resolution site characterization or other investigation that brings us data required to inform the decision. Effectively, um, let's go to slide 88. We would like to display the results or as part of our performance evaluation. We want to we want to graph our results. And if you look at the slide, the green the green portion of the graph in the, or picture in the lower left is, that is the performance model, um, the, um, the margin between the green and the yellow is the performance model that we talked about on uh, slide uh, 86 previously. We want to track actual versus expected performance. We have, uh, we have an expected rate of change, and we want to plot in this case shown as the dotted dash black line, the, the actual performance after we implement the remedy. And we see, as, is, as expected for this particular one, soil vapor extraction uh, targeting a volatile contaminant, that it starts off working with a pretty effective rate of uh, contaminant removal. And then uh, at about the end of year one, we start to see that effectiveness tail off. And by graphing this out, and doing the monitoring data, you can see at about year one and a half, there was a uh, process improvement implemented. And in this exercise, it involved adding a thermal component to enhance the ability to extract vapor phase contaminants. And we see then, following that performance or optimization or additional technology, we see that um, performance once again improves. Um, it, it declines more rapidly. However, we note that it stays in that yellow zone. That yellow zone represents a, uh, a area of marginal performance where optimization may be warranted or 
um, if we follow the green dash line further uh, to about year three, we see that it actually begins to enter uh, the red area indicating unsatisfactory performance. Now, at this point in time, we have a decision to make. Is there a, another technology that could be implemented? Is it time to transition to a, a different approach, such as monitored natural attenuation? Um, and have we done all we can do, or is there some other response that we could reasonably implement? Let's go to slide 89. Uh, the guidance has a, uh, a checklist that gives you attributes to address in the periodic evaluation. As with all these sorts of checklists, um, your individual site may require um, addition of, of other elements of, of consideration that you identified as important. But we're primarily focusing on have we adequately addressed the, the contaminant properties? Has the source mass been adequately evaluated? Do we understand plume dynamics? Is our technology performing as designed? And are there alternatives to technology that can um, alternative technologies that can actually benefit or are effective. Let's go to slide 90. Hey, Sam, on that one, on 89 is where we had that poll, and it says, when is the best time to review technology performance in detail? And so far, respondents, most of them are saying during every periodic evaluation. Yeah. And my opinion on that poll question is that that is the minimum acceptable answer. We have to do it at least on every scheduled periodic evaluation. And at different levels of complexity, um, we're going to also look at it after individual monitoring events. Uh, if we identify technology failure, even if it's sooner than a periodic uh, scheduled evaluation, or if, um, if we've been more successful than anticipated. So that one's really kind of all of the above, but not less than every periodic evaluation. Okay, if we can go on to slide 90. Effectively, there are a few decisions that we have to make during each periodic evaluation. Uh, the first one is, did, are, we, are we done? Did the remedy uh, accomplish the objective, uh, which is a bit optimistic, but you'll see that in the green circle at the bottom. The second option is the remedies on track, and we need to keep doing what we're doing. The, the process is working. Uh, as we showed in the case study, we, we may make a decision that optimization is needed. Or the final option is that our efforts to our plan is not working uh, effectively as, as we desired. Uh, we've, we've exhausted. Um, our ability to optimize it or tweak it, and it's time to, um, to think about uh, whether it's warranted to implement an alternative approach or not. You'll see that there are feedback loops, uh, as Mike pointed out, from each one of these decisions that take us back into either the design and execution of a decision or the evaluation or reevaluation of the site, which would be a repetition of the uh, processes Mike described in section four. For a complex site, we are logically going through, going to go through this activity uh, several times. It's, um, if, if we say 30 years is a nominal time frame for a complex site, as an arbitrary example, that would have us going through performance evaluations every five years at least six times. So you get the idea that this is a recurring process and as we and we learn as we go, and each iteration is going to bring uh, increased uh, understanding of the CSM. Uh, we're going to have more understanding of how technology performs on a site-specific basis, and what we learn from from the investigations and the evaluation of technology performance is going to shed insight on attributes of the site that we need additional evaluation to to adequately address. Let's go to slide 91. This is a site in Colorado uh, that illustrates many of the points that we've talked about. 
Uh, it's a, a mixed contaminant uh, site, TCE and the NDMA, uh, located in, in bedrock. Uh, part of the rock is fractured. Uh, these are both recalcitrant chemicals. The hydrogeology is exceptionally complex in that this site is located in um, the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, and uh, there's some pretty extreme geology in the subsurface. Um, that limits the ability to extract contamination or to uh, insert substrates. Um, the process evaluation determined that enhanced bioremediation could be effective for TCE. Um, that was implemented as an interim action. Uh, the response was, was favorable, but achieved an asymptotic concentration above the, uh, the published uh, remedial objective. In the case of NDMA, there was no uh, available technology that could be deployed in situ for that particular contaminant. There had been a number of pilot studies at the site that uh, had demonstrated the effectiveness or lack of effectiveness of the available technologies. In, at the rod, MNA was selected as the, uh, rem as the uh, remedial approach. There was a technical impracticability included in the decision document uh, addressing the NDMA and the source areas, and that technical impracticability was, part, uh, was um, supported by an enforceable environmental covenant. If you look at the picture, the yellow margin is the site boundary you can see some green and a bit of blue uh, areas of plume extending off-site, and the environmental covenant uh, encompassed those areas of off-site migration uh, where, uh, where the institutional controls could prevent exposure. So to slide 92. So in summary, we've talked about the value of the plan and why we do it. Uh, we've enumerated the components and hopefully shed some insight on how we use those components to structure uh, questions and evaluations that will inform how we adapt over time to address our site. Uh, we talked about the importance of the performance evaluation and, and the monitoring plan that supports those analyses and that we need to follow a systematic decision logic to arriving at our uh, at our site management. And with that, I believe we turn this back over to John, who will help us understand how to take action. John? Thank, thank you, Sam. I appreciate it. OK, I'm going to move on to preparing you to take action. So our trainers referenced ITRC and other organizations' guidance. And those guidance documents give us the technologies to address certain problems that we're going to encounter at complex sites. Uh, Mike Truex also talked about flexibility within the regulations. If you look through, he actually showed a few examples of the acceptability of those approaches to different states. Um, we have the complete poll results in the guidance document, and that's worth looking through to get a, a laundry list of some uh, approaches that can be used. Um, throughout uh, today's training, we stress the site conceptual model. It not only has to be robust, but we have to be willing to refine it over time as we learn more about our site. And we will learn more as we're remediating in addition to characterizing the site. Um, and and uh, Mary, I think I had a poll also. Do you want to pull that up? Thank you. Yeah, so this is just uh, if you could give us some feedback about uh, what you've heard today, if you would recommend using adaptive site management your sites, uh, either yes or no, or, or you might be unsure either because you need to learn more about adaptive site management itself or you need to understand your, and think some more about your site. So it uh, looks like we're getting a pretty strong response yes, and, and then some people that are unsure for various reasons. Um, and then finally, about adaptive site management, if we're going to use interim objectives, um, it's important to make them uh, to make consensus interim objectives. And the way to do that is by talking uh, to regulators, talking to the community, and talking to tribal governments if that's applicable. Okay, thank you, Mary. Whoops. 
Okay, so what actions can you yourself take uh, to make progress at complex sites? So first, um, we've given you a taste of the guidance. You can uh, go through the entire guidance. There's lots of good information in there, and you can start using it and encouraging other people to use it, whether they're site owners, responsible parties, regulators, or your stakeholder groups. Um, second, um, you have to know your site. Um, it's, again, it's important to have a strong conceptual site model and um, un understand your site, both your technical and your non-technical challenges. Um, we've shown you a tool to do remediation potential assessment. You can do that either as you're proceeding with characterization or if you've already got remediation going. Um, you can apply the eight questions and uh, the matrix that Chuck presented um, to see if you want to go back and rethink things. Um, and again, the key takeaway is uh, applying adaptive site management includes setting interim objectives and establishing performance expectations that you reevaluate periodically to see if you want to change your decisions. Um, and again, uh, stakeholders are just so important at complex sites. They can really uh, influence things both positively and negatively. And uh, it's good to get them involved early, develop a relationship, and uh, maintain that relationship throughout the uh, progress at the site because more than likely that relationship can go on for 20 or 30 years even, which has been my experience up at the Hanford site. And with that, I think I turn it back to you, Mary, for another question and answer period. Yes, thank you, John. We do have time for questions and answers. And in just a moment, I'll come back to our phone lines. And you can ask your questions out loud if you'd like to. Uh, but for everyone, you can enter your questions in the Q&A pod in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, taking us to the last slide here as we wrap up, uh, we do have links to additional resources available to you. You can access the guidance document that served as the basis for today's training. That site, of course, will remain active. So if you'd like to come back to it at a later time, you're certainly welcome to do so. I am going to pull up just a couple more poll questions here as we wrap up. If you would take time to fill those out, we would appreciate it. And for those of you that do need continuing education documentation, please complete the feedback form. At the end of that form, there's a box for you to click to certify you participated today. Once you submit that, a certificate will be, per will be provided to you. We would like to hear from everyone about your experience with today's training, so we'd ask everyone go ahead and fill out that feedback form. If, as we wrap up today, if there's any questions that we haven't addressed but you would like to follow up with us after the fact, you can always email us at training at itrcweb. Org. I'm going to go ahead and open up to our phone lines now. If you have any questions for the trainers, make sure you unmute hitting star six, or excuse me, pound six to unmute. Any questions from the phone lines? All right, we'll go ahead and answer some of our typed in questions. Um, this person says, how can you use this process to ensure ACLs are being appropriately applied? Any thoughts on that from the trainers? Uh, well, this is Chuck. It's just that, that, that um, I think ACLs are part of this this idea that if you um, are, are one alternative way, of course, there are ACLs to um, define what the what the goals are, what the remediation goals are, and so um, it is an appropriate way to do this. Um, and so, in terms of how do you ensure they're done correctly, I think there's some good guidance by EPA in terms of you know they've got the different figures of where the point of compliance is and where the point of exposure is or where the different concentrations are. So I just think it's um, um, and it can be an important element in managing complex sites, a real important one, uh, but, but then, as you, as you know, you just have to do it correctly. All right. Does the ITRC guidance document provide any insight or guidance on the best way to track projects as they're being moved through the process discussed today?
um, this is Chuck again. I don't think there's any any um, you know uh, I'm just trying to remember through there any software or anything like that in terms of project management software or any any tools that that go through that. Um, um, but um, I'm just trying to just sort of do this by memory. Um, but there are um, you know, there's project you know general project management tools for any sort of construction project. But but I think this is maybe more specific to to our process is that. There's the there is the flowchart in our our guidance, and so maybe that's the key thing is is just go that 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 flowchart. And the key things about the flowchart are these loops that go back in there. When you learn something new about your site, go back and redo that conceptual model, understand that, keep it keep it going. And so so maybe that's the key theme of this document is that the the process is in the flowchart. Right. Can you please elaborate more on using a conceptual site model specific to this process that has been discussed today? Uh, this is Roy. Sure, I'll, I'll chime in on that, Mary. So what we, we had talked about under the site challenges how uh, to use, integrate both those technical and non-technical challenges into the CSM. And I think we all are comfortable with the general conceptual site model of telling us uh, where contaminant is and how it's transported and its potential exposure points. But really, this guidance is trying to expand uh, the understanding of the site and, and where you want to take the site or where the best end use is for the site. So with that, you really are trying to uh, modify the traditional look of the conceptual site model to become, in itself, more adaptive. So it's a continuous feedback loop on the conceptual site model. So it's not just a one and done. It's that initial look at the site. And then as you progress through development of creating site objectives, continuing to modify and update that conceptual site model with both those technical and non-technical um, complexities to make sure that you're still on the right path. I, this is Sam. I, I'd like to foot stomp that a little bit. We've, we've looked at it. And the center where I work, we looked at a number of sites. And as we look at the portfolio, there's a number of times where the conceptual models were based on assumptions. And the guidance seeks to challenge us to let's validate the assumptions. Uh, does the performance data match what we would expect if the assumptions are accurate? And in those cases where performance or progress is not uh, not lining up with our understanding of the conceptual model, then we need to identify uh, what are the additional things we need to learn about the site in order that we can bring our expectations into closer alignment with the, the performance. Because we find often that there's uh, sites are not adequately characterized. There may be sources that are not uh, uh, identified there may be uh, contaminated zones that are not adequately uh, addressed by the technology. So there's a myriad of things here that uh, this process would bring to light in terms of creating a more robust CSM. Right. Do you find that states and the US EPA are amenable to the adaptive management approach? Yeah, this, this is John Price. I'll jump in since I'm a state regulator. Um, you know, speaking from my own experience at the U.S. Department of, Han of Energy Hanford site, uh, we've been very comfortable working with uh, interim objectives since 1992, and we're currently working on a decision for a 20-square-mile groundwater plume up here where uh, both uh, U.S. EPA, our local office, and uh, the state agreed that we couldn't get to a final decision, but it was important to take action on the groundwater plume, so we are uh, doing that. So it, it is very agreeable in, in my experience. And I think that kind of takes care of our next question, but you may want to elaborate further. It says, records of decisions are made on many sites. Is it appropriate to include interim objectives in the record of decision? Oh, yeah, it absolutely is. Yeah, I think I, I covered that already. Yeah, and in fact, you, you want to make a, I think you want to make a decision about those interim objectives rather than just working to them kind of qualitatively or informally. Because I think as, uh, as, as Sam mentioned in one of his slides, um, you know, 
people's memories change, you have turnover in staff, so it's really important to document those decisions, and the best place to do that is in a cleanup decision. Mary, I, I just uh, added on to what John said. I, I, would add, I would just add one cautionary tale to um, the subject of interim. You know, there, there is the ability to do interim rods or records of decision as well. Uh, which in many cases uh, is is valuable for for helping a site to understand, you know, how to best address uh, the impacts. But oftentimes, sites that are in interim, working under interim rod, fail to get out of it. Um, they get they get kind of stuck there, and that in itself becomes a part of the reason why we have this guidance, because you you don't want to have a site stuck in a situation where it's just not progressing. So uh, just a Again, a cautionary tale about um, you know interim rods or even interim objectives themselves um, can work both ways, and you've got to be aware of that. I just again to put stop Roy's point is we have sites that are operating remedies as as interim actions without a rod. We have others where the action implemented in a rod is is not working. And in all cases, when you do a reasonable performance evaluation and go to the regulators with data that demonstrate that case, it's a, it's a very powerful communication tool to allow you to stop doing things that don't work so that you can refocus your energies and resources on something that could, has the potential to work better. And it's important that we do that where we can. All right, well, I think that wraps us up today with our questions and answers and our training for today. Again, if we haven't addressed your question and you would like some follow-up after the class, you can email us at training at itrcweb.org, and we will do our best to follow up with the trainers on that. A very special thank you to our trainers for taking time out of their busy schedules to serve as volunteers for ITRC. We very much appreciate the expertise not only you shared with us today, but throughout the several years of that guidance document being developed. Also, thanks to our participants. We're always glad to have you on the line. We do have several other ITRC training courses coming up in the next few weeks. Please check out the ITRC website or go directly to the cluen.org website to learn about the upcoming training classes. More information about ITRC and all of our guidance documents and training classes is also available at the ITRC website, which is itrcweb.org.